Stephen Downs is a senior researcher for Canada's National Research Council and a leading proponent of the use of online media and services in education. As an author of the widely read Old Daily online newsletter, Downs has earned international recognition for his leading edge work in the field of online learning. He developed some of Canada's first online courses at Assiniboon Community College in Brandon, Manitoba. He also built a learning management system from scratch and authored the now classic, The Future of Online Learning. At the University of Alberta, uh, at the University of Alberta, Downs built a learning and research portal for the uh, municipal sector of that province, province Munimal. I know I have a lot of Canadians in the audience today, so I'm totally, <laughs> totally going to mess this up, uh, <laughs> including the president who's sitting there staring at me. Um, uh, Muni Mall, and another for the engineering and geology sec sector, Pegasus. He also pioneered the development of learning objects and was one of the first adopters and developers of RSS content syndication in education. Downs introduced the concept of e-learning 2.0 and with George Siemens, who was here uh, a few years ago, developed and defined the concept of connectivism using the social network approach to deliver open online courses to 3,000 participants in over two years. Impressive. Downs has been offering courses in learning, logic, philosophy, both online and off, since 1987. He has 135 articles published in books, magazines, and academic journals, and has presented his unique perspective on online learning and technology to more than, 200, more than 250 times to audiences in 17 countries on five continents. He is a habitual, this is the fun part, he is a habitual photographer, plays darts for money, <laughs> and could be found at home with his wife Andrea and four cats in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. Welcome, Stephen Downs. Careful not to trip over all the tech there. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a very exciting day for those of us in Canada. And uh, this presentation today was <laughs> prepared and influenced by events in our country, uh, not the least of which is the royal marriage <laughs> of William and Kate, our future sovereign, although we are happy to share with Britain, Australia, and from time to time on royal tours, even with the United States. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it's a red letter day for us. So this is the second most important event. <laughs> <laughs> My talk today is going to cover sweeping vistas, and I even have a photo, which I forgot to put in the presentation, with a sweeping vista. Um, it brings together three areas that I've been involved with for a long time, and, and I haven't brought them together this way before, so it's high time I did so. And those three areas are, first of all, the personal learning environment, secondly, uh, the learning theory known as connectivism, and third, open educational resources and open learning. And there is a thesis, I have a thesis, I also forgot to put that in the slide. Sometimes you don't know what you're going to say until after you've organized the talk and sent the slides, by which time it's too late. <laughs> uh, and, and the thesis is simply this. The three of these things go together. You don't really get one without the other. Open educational resources need personal learning environments and they need connectivism. Connectivism needs OERs and PLEs, etc. These three things go together. They're part and parcel of the same theory. So this talk is going to cover a lot of ground very quickly, like a horse running on a, never mind. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I, I, I realized, and, and this is sort of an undercurrent theme to the talk too, I spend more time talking to the first slide than any other slide, by the way, because this is the part I make up on the fly. I realized 
coming into Saratoga, and I, I wandered around and I took some photographs, that's one of them, that you really don't get the design motif in this town or this city without understanding that they have a horse race here every year. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not know that coming in. I've heard of the Triple Crown, I just never associated it with Saratoga Springs, so now I know. And that's what I learned yesterday. <laughs> I also learned that the random screenings that they do at the border, not random. <laughs> All right, so let's launch in. Just so that you all know, this, conversa this conversation, and it is a conversation, if you feel like shouting out, do so. Uh, I can handle it, and I will feel free to depart from the slides, the presentation, whatever. At a moment's notice, I'm already doing it, right? So, <laughs> at a moment's notice, so do feel free to chip in. It's being broadcast, webcast, recorded, photographed, audio recorded, I've got it going out on my radio station. Don't say anything you're going to regret. <laughs> <laughs> that applies doubly for me. Because <laughs> I, I still have a job with the federal government and I'd like to keep it. That was interesting, 10-year awards. I've worked with the federal government for 10 years, which is a testament to the endurance of our federal government. <laughs> Now, this is someone else's computer, so let's see if this works. Ah. All right. Dozens of years ago, uh, I worked with, I worked at a place called, <laughs> it's moved it that far. <laughs> uh, I worked with a place called Assiniboine Community College and had a network of computers and Ethernet and all of that, and a thing called a net hopper, and what a net hopper does is it connects your network over telephone lines to uh, a mainframe system at, say, a Cinnamon College, allowing you thus to provide internet where there is no internet. Now we don't need that anymore. We have internet everywhere, but we needed it then. And I wandered around rural Manitoba showing people the internet. It was this great new thing. It was a, this wonderful thing. Everybody was interested. It was going to bring education to rural Manitoba and across Canada and around the world. Fast forward 10 years and we have a new dream, a similar dream. One laptop per child, a $100 computer which came in at around 200, 300 Canadian. <laughs> Of course, now that's reversed, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's been a good year. <laughs> and with an election on Monday. <laughs> uh, but like I said, I'd like to keep my job. So, uh, <laughs> and, and one laptop per child with, with the promise, again, of affordable, open education and a new kind of education, which I'll talk about in a little bit for people around the world. And fast forward another 10 years to 2016. How many of you have an iPad or some similar sort of tablet today? Yeah, okay, so maybe a quarter of you. By 2016, you'll all have one. You won't be able to live without it. There will be seminars on dealing without your iPad while it's broken. <laughs> But by 2016, and that's like five years from now, they will have virtually replaced books. I mean, we've got these Kindles here uh, being distributed to these children in Nigeria, as you can see, and they've got 80 books on each Kindle. 80 books on each Kindle. Can you imagine? That was unimaginable 10 years ago. But 80 books will seem ridiculous. It will seem pitiful in 2016. There'll be 800, there'll be 8,000 books on these things, guaranteed. It changes education. It's game changing, it's totally game changing. The last time that happened, and I know people have used this example over and over and over, but it matters because it's the same kind of change. And that, of course, and you should recognize the guy's picture there, that's Gutenberg 
and the idea of a new kind of learning, a new kind of dissemination of knowledge becoming possible. And one of the sub-themes of this talk is that it changed language. It changed the language of learning literally, not figuratively, literally. Before Gutenberg, the language of learning, the language of knowledge, the language of religion was Latin. Today it's a dead language. It's not an accident. There were wars fought over it. Learning historically has come to be associated with language, has come to be associated with literacy, has come to be associated with libraries. The reason why, and this is my subthesis, the reason why connectivism, open educational resources, and personal learning environments all go together is because at heart they are all connected through this nexus of language, literacy, and libraries. Our language of learning is changing as a result of these new technologies and because of this change we need to be thinking about and using different technologies in order to accomplish learning and I'll even say training, etc. Big issue. I won't get into that. And so we have the idea of open learning. And the idea of open learning has been around for a while now. It's, it's been around for two decades, three decades, even longer. There's the School of the Air in Australia, not pictured here because it's wireless. Uh, that makes no sense. Never mind. Uh, there's uh, of course, the, the granddaddy, the Open University in Britain. There's Athabasca University in Canada. I worked with Athabasca for seven years. A testament to the endurance of Athabasca University. Um, and where George Siemens now works and Terry Anderson, who also spoke at this conference, now works. Athabasca is a nexus of, I'm overusing that word, uh, of uh, open learning in Canada. There's the uh, Indira Gandhi National Open University in India, the largest university in the world. Again, uh, a bastion of open learning. Open learning is rolling out into the world in various phases. James Taylor proposed a set of phases. Uh, Sir John Daniel, who associated with the Commonwealth of Learning, talked about the phases. The phases are kind of like learners access courses, then there's open support or open teaching. Then there's open assessment of some sort. And then there's open credentialing, et cetera. We're seeing that progression happening. It's not always happening exactly the way Taylor or Daniel describes it. But we are seeing, almost like uh, a tidal wave, these different phases of open learning taking over the institutions. And so we have open educational resources, which is the first of these phases. Open educational resources have been around for a while now. They draw on the initial concept of learning objects. Audio OK? It's scratching. Scratching? OK. Slight yep. I, I love the way some people at the edge there took the advantage to get out of the room. <laughs> uh, they thought I wasn't watching because I had to keep my head still. Was, I don't have good peripheral vision. But. So the idea of open educational resources it goes hand in hand with the idea of learning objects, the idea of small, mobile, portable, discoverable, reusable resources that you can plug together like Legos or atoms or whatever metaphor you want to use. We've got open content licenses to support open educational resources. For example, the Creative Commons license that allows you to share your resource, and I'm sure you're mostly familiar with these Creative Commons license. You can reserve some rights, for example, the right to be attributed to get credit for your work, the, the right to restrict the use of your work to non-commercial uses only, 
the right to require that the work be used without derivatives. And so we have a set of different open educational resource licenses. Uh, these follow from the original GNU free documentation license that was uh, created in order to support open source software. And there's a long history which could occupy an entire talk in itself between open source software and open educational resources and the relation between those. David Wiley deserves note and credit for his own open publication license and for his own work in this country. He's worked at various levels of government and with a variety of organizations, institutions, and foundations to promote open educational resources. Someone was asking who would be a good person. David Wiley would be a good person to have talk at this conference. He'd be great. You'd love him. Um, and then after open educational resources and open licensing, we have open courseware. And this is the idea of the content of a course being packaged and made available for free. And of course, the granddaddy, it's hard to call something that's only 10 years old a granddaddy, isn't it? Of open courseware is, uh, of course, MIT's open courseware initiative. These are not complete courses. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. They've taken the, the content of the course, the syllabus, some simulations, some video recordings, etc., packaged them, made them available on their website. Now they're used by millions of people worldwide. And ask anyone from MIT and they'll give you all the statistics. It's an incredible success story. It spawned the Open Courseware Consortium, which is a network of universities around the world that are doing the same sort of thing. I had the privilege, and it was a privilege, of going to Taiwan to help with the launch of Open Courseware in Taiwan. Uh, that was um, with Lucifer Chu. There's another good person. He'd be fascinating. He, Luke Chu, made, made a pile of money translating the Lord of the Rings into Chinese. <laughs> he just did it on spec, right? Nobody thought the Chinese would be interested. So he just went ahead and did it and then made a bunch of money doing it. And so now he's got, now he's a young guy. He's got a bunch of money, and he's thinking, what can I do? And he, got, he founded a project called OOPS, O-O-P-S. And I forget exactly what it stands for, but basically what it was was a project to translate open courseware materials into Chinese. And so he is the father, not the grandfather, of open courseware in, in Taiwan. And of course, the, the mainland Chinese have their own initiative going as well. Uh, open courseware, this is Connections, another interesting project out of Rice University. And what they've done that's different is they've provided an environment that you can go to and work in to create your own open courseware and then offer it, again, as open access material through their online interface. Very interesting, very innovative project. Uh, there's the OER Commons which is a single point of access for open educational resources from huge numbers of projects worldwide, because there are now hundreds of these projects worldwide. They're all over the place. There's the Open Content Alliance, which again is bringing together open courseware from around the world. And two projects that are of particular interest to me, Internet Archive, which is created by Brewster Cowley, and basically it takes everything it finds on the internet and stores it, which is really cool. It's rescued my websites from like 1995 because they were lost. And then they were found through the Internet Archive. Our media is intended as the same sort of thing for audio and video. And our media was created by Mark Cantor, who has a history being one of the people who came up with uh, Flash uh, and other things in macromedia. Uh, and uh, J.D. Lassica, well-known in open journalism circles, and I was involved in that project as well. If you go to our media and look at the design, I did the design. 
I'm not proud of it, but no, I'm just kidding. I am proud of <laughs> it. Uh, oh, the Open University in Britain has a thing called Open Courseware. These are entire course packages sliced, diced, and put up there for your uh, learning pleasure. And they are complete courses, unlike MIT's, which aren't. These are complete courses. And so we've almost come full circle, haven't we, to the traditional distance learning package. The, uh, I'm not sure what you guys use, but when I used, when I worked with Athabasca University, there'd be a, a package. It would come in a typical kind of, well, box. It was always this wide by this wide, so, you know, it's sort of narrow. It looked like a file. Anyhow, I've got hundreds of those at home. The boxes, not the courses. They, they make great file folders, and I've kept them ever since. And the, the course package with the programmed learning and any supplemental materials. And if you're lucky, extra things like one course I signed up for, I didn't teach a psychology course, which had a plastic model of a human brain. I never did get my brain. <laughs> But I never did pass the course either. So, uh, in Toot um, is a free online service providing you with a database of hand-selected web resources. Now, in Toot has closed down, uh, and the reason why it's closed down is because hand-selecting resources turns out to involve a lot of overhead. Another project called Merlot which is based uh, here in the United States and also has affiliates in Canada, similarly intended to have open educational resources reviewed by academic staff. And it turns out having them manually reviewed involves a lot of overhead. They had thousands of resources, but only a few hundred of them were reviewed. GLOBE is an international alliance which included Merlot and also a number of other initiatives, Ariadne from Europe, Edna from Australia, LORNET, Learning Object Repository Network from Ontario in Canada, and others. And basically the idea is to bring together all of these resources into a federated search network. I could argue, again, for another hour whether harvesting or federation is the better way to go. Harvesting better, federation bad, never mind. Uh, as you can see, I search for myself. That's how I test these things. It really is a good test because over time, you get to know what to expect, right, when you search for yourself. And so you can use the search for yourself to evaluate all these different search services. Plus, nobody gets tired of reading about themselves. <laughs> OK, that's the background. That's, that's the environment. That's where we're at today. A lot of resources, a lot of activity, a lot of money being spent. And again, I've got a whole talk on the sustainability of open educational resources. Let's put that into the present framework, the present perspective. And the present framework is the learning management system. And because this is a talk on open educational resources, I put a picture up of Moodle. Moodle, as I'm sure you all know, is open source software, a learning management system created by Martin Dugiamass uh, from Australia. Uh, interestingly, right after this conference, I drive back to Montreal, I fly to Edmonton, where I'll meet with him and others uh, at the Moodle Moot conference in, in Edmonton, where I'm also speaking. And I'll go there and I'll talk about my own software. No, I won't do that. <laughs> um, the Moodle is just one of the learning management systems. You know the others. There are other open source, such as Sakai, which was developed for large enterprise systems. Uh, Blackboard, or as I've put here, as it turns out entirely appropriately, <laughs> Backboard, which I've been reading over the last week, is now considering offers to be purchased. So OK, that's interesting. Saba is very well known in commercial uh, learning management systems. Desire to Learn, I just completed a major project with Desire to Learn with other people at National Research Council, uh, developing something called Synergique, 
which was a uh, collaborative learning resources authoring tool. Interesting project, took way too much of my life, but it, it, it taught me a lot about learning management systems. The learning management system, all of these learning management systems I've, I've described, all do kind of the same thing. And that is they take learning resources and they organize them into a course structure and this course structure is the same course structure we all pretty much grew up with. Um, I'm looking at the older people in the audience, people who have hair like me wondering, did you grow up with these course structures? And yeah, you probably did, I did. Uh, and they're structured as though they were books with chapters, only in a course we'll call it a week instead of a book or a chapter. Uh, they're linear flows of information. You step through the content, First you learn this, then you learn this, then you learn this, and then you learn this. The evaluation in a learning management system, as in a traditional course, is typically an evaluation of the knowledge retained, right? And that's probably, probably, darn near certainly, how the evaluation in the courses that you teach works, right? You have certain learning objectives, certain content that you expect people to learn, perhaps certain skills that you expect them to acquire. And they will be evaluated through tests or quizzes, perhaps a practicum if we're lucky, uh, to see whether they have in fact remembered the content that we, the instructors, have been entrusted to transfer to these students. Does that sound right? Okay. Okay. Well, that, that's, that is definitely worth knowing, and I'm glad I asked that. Is it correct, though, to say that the objective of this, because what you're describing to me sounds like kind of a constructivist kind of approach, is it still correct to say that the objective here is to transfer content? No. no. Kind of, kind of on the cusp. <laughs> more engaging. Yeah. All right. More. Okay. That's good. Then, I'm, then I am speaking to the right group, the group that already agrees with me. <laughs> Chap, go ahead, please. I think we've got a, a continuum. Yeah. We certainly have some, some courses that are, are more kind of more traditional in terms of what textbook thing. And then we, we Mm -hmm. Excellent. And and you had a comment? Yes. Uh, actually, I think an income tax course is as strange as it may sound. It's an ideas course because <laughs> really this is a course a new book is signed and the book is you know, some parts of the book have come obsolete. Right. Know. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense, especially with, with something that changes every year. And you're right, it does change every year. It, it makes no sense to remember what the current income tax law is. Oh. <laughs> That's right, yeah. I complain about our income tax laws, but yeah, no, I, I, I understand that, yeah, it's complicated here. <laughs> That's good. That's encouraging. That's development in the, in the direction that I endorse. Let me continue to talk about that. Notice how I'm adapting on the fly. Is a lot of, I'll tell you, and I'll be really honest here, is a lot of the audiences that I talk to, I'm talking like this and they're all going, nodding, that's what we do. 
uh, I go to universities, especially university professor audiences, but also K-12 school audiences, and they're looking at me and they're nodding. Yep, this is what we do. There is content, they're expected to learn the content, we will test them on their recollection of this content. That you're not doing this tells me that you have gone through a lot of these battles and I'm sure they were battles, and also that you've had a lot of background experience in delivering learning in non-traditional ways. That would, I take it, be correct. Now I'm saying nods. I just want to mention, too, that the, the timing of this particular focus on the LMS is perfect, mm -hmm. because we as an institution are looking at alternatives to Angel, which was recently uh, you know, was pur purchased by Blackboard. So we're looking right. at Blackboard and Canvas, Desire to Learn, uh -huh. and I forgot what the fourth one was. Moodle. 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 Yeah. So uh, this could really help us uh, in the thinking through that, that process. And I know a lot of people in this room are really interested in what happens with that particular committee and that particular recommendation. And it's interesting, even though we're in ANGEL, we've really modified the environment extensively with a lot of open doubt. resources yeah. by embedding these other tools such as Open Atrium into that environment and of course working outside of that environment and now of course we're moving towards mobile. So this is right. very relevant to, to where we are now and what we're thinking about. And to that committee, I would say, don't sign a long-term deal. <laughs> Can't hear the comments. Okay. People have questions. Can you? Is this working? No. <laughs> Everyone's this, saying this, no. This is working. You can't hear it here, but they can hear it out there. Yeah. Okay. So if there are questions, maybe we can pass the microphone around. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. No. No problem. It's important. People online should hear too. It, it's, it, it's funny because while you were talking, I sort of surreptitiously snuck a look at my computer and thought, yeah, it'll pick up his voice. <laughs> So, all right, uh, I also have it on double gain, just in case. Uh, all right, where was I going to go with this? Oh, yes. So, this is where it's going, because the learning management system, as you all well know, was designed for that earlier mode of teaching, was designed to facilitate a course that is structured like a book that goes through chapter to chapter that presents information as content. WebCT, one of the original learning management systems, the CT stood for course tools. Uh, Blackboard never really changed from its roots as a course, a, a hosted course system. And, and the rest of the learning management systems are more or less the same. And I, I've worked with Moodle, I've worked in depth with Desire to Learn, I, I've worked with all of them to some degree, and they're all doing something like that. The personal learning environment takes the concept of the LMS and turns it on its head. The LMS is centered around the course, the LMS is centered around the institution, but the personal learning environment is centered around the individual. This is a famous document, a famous diagram. It was created by Scott Wilson uh, of CETIS, uh, part of JISC in Britain. Future VLE actually means the student. They're British. <laughs> <laughs> And the idea here is that your personal learning environment sits at the center of a network of other resources and connects you to those resources. This is a really good diagram. This is why it's so famous, because it gives you some examples of the sorts of resources that it might be connected to, like Flickr for your photographs, LiveJournal, which still exists, by the way, even though it's owned by Russians, uh, which is a blogging platform. Well, it's, Live Journal was bought by Russians and everybody scratched their head because you know, it was just, it was so novel. And, but it, it's still a going concern. I still have a Live Journal page and I've, I've blogged three times in 10 years on it. But. Uh, personal hosting, 43 things, which doesn't exist anymore, which was a, uh, a task 
application, Bolton Institute there, which was a learning management system, alerts, etc. And so the I, and the lines, and you notice the little text, you can't read the little text, but it doesn't matter, talks about the different standards or specifications that would be used in order to facilitate the connection between these external resources and the personal learning environment, which is that thing in the center. All this talk, and this is a little off slide, but you've, you've probably heard of talk about APIs, programming interfaces, uh, OAuth, uh, RSS and similar standards, etc. All of these are standards, even web services, although web services <laughs> are sort of like old and almost dying now. All of these things are specifications, I know I insulted all the web services people in the room. <laughs> uh, are there any web services people in the room? And again, I, I looked at the older people. Uh, sorry, I'm having fun with web services people. I'm a, I shouldn't. Anyhow, these are all standards and specifications for connecting separate programming environments, separate application environments. And the whole concept of web 2.0, which you've heard of, I'm sure, and which is now almost old hat, is the concept of connecting these distributed applications and services. We started messing around with this sort of thing at National Research Council, and this is one of the concepts that I worked on. It was called My Glue, and basically we did a very simple thing. It took a number of RSS feeds that were described in an OPML file. OPML stands for out, uh, sorry, Outline Processor Markup Language, which is a ridiculous name for it because all it is is a list of RSS feeds. It was created by a guy called Dave Weiner, one of the founders of RSS, a very interesting guy. Um, and all it did was join those RSS feeds together to create a new RSS feed. Oh, and filter it for topics because I wanted to get useful topics and not cat pictures, and provide output. And this is the heart, the heart, really, of the personal learning environment. Over time, I created an application called Grasshopper. This is what it looks like now. I only made this diagram like three or four days ago. It brings in input either directly from the user or from various content feeds, and I didn't even bother listing the specifications because there are dozens of specifications of different types of content feeds. RSS, you know, it's funny you ask that because there is widespread disagreement in the field about what RSS stands for. The original RSS stood for Resource Site Summary. Is that right? No, Rich Site Summary. Rich Site Summary is created by Netscape, and it was all it was was intended to be a list of titles, descriptions, and URLs of articles published in a magazine. So a magazine would provide this list of titles, and then a third-party service, in this case Netscape, would bring in this list and display a list of titles and short descriptions of magazine articles, and people could click on them and go read the magazine article. It sounds so ordinary today, right? Uh, but, but back then, this is like 97, 98, it was revolutionary. My RSS feed for OL Daily, which actually came out before the newsletter, uh, the, the email newsletter, was Netscape RSS feed number 31. I'm very proud of that. Uh, because who knew? So, and, and RSS, later stood for uh, RDF Site Summary. RDF is Resource Description Framework, and that was a way of describing resources that was created by the World Wide Web Consortium. And then Dave Weiner came out with something called RSS 2.0, uh, and renamed RSS once again, so that it became called Really Simple Syndication. That one kind of stuck. <laughs> Don't know why the other ones didn't catch on. 
Um, and, and, and it gets to the heart of the concept, doesn't it? Really simple syndication. It's a way for you to allow your content to be distributed to many people through a simple coding mechanism, a simple machine-readable mechanism for distributing your content, RSS. I've proposed over the years, that is such a great idea. I, th I think there should be RSS for all kinds of things, like people, really simple people. <laughs> Didn't catch on. <laughs> uh, but there is friend of a friend, FOAF, which does that task. Really simple organizations, RSO. But I think RSO is in use by someone else. I don't know who. Um, et cetera, right? Uh, really simple institutions, RSI. Really simple courses, RSC, et cetera. Anything, and this is the idea of Grasshopper. Anything you can think of to syndicate, Grasshopper syndicates. And it reads the syndication of that. It's, it, it's such a neat tool, and it would be so much better if there were more than one in existence in the world, because then it could read other people's feeds. So, and this is what happens, right? The feeds come in. You got links, posts, templates, boxes, feeds, presentations, uh, publications, organizations, events, you name it. All of these things are represented in their own different feed. Our grasshopper ingests them organizes them, filters them, runs them through a, um, what did I call it, a, a mapper, and then stores it in a database. Then these contents are used by, well, in, right now, me, because I have the instance of Grasshopper. But they would, in a PLE, they would be used by students, and they would be organized however the students wanted, organized, reshaped, reframed, etc and then sent out in any of a variety of formats. I use Grasshopper to send out my daily newsletter. I use it to publish all of my web pages. I use it to create my RSS and other <coughs> web feeds. So I have the one application that does all of this for me. You'd really think it would catch on. But... And sooner or later, someone at Stanford or MIT or Harvard's going to invent this, right? And, and they'll be credited with inventing it. And it'll be all over the place. But th this is what it'll basically look like. We used Grasshopper to offer a bunch of courses uh, at NRC through, well, it depended, but uh, we offered connectivism courses, connectivism and connective knowledge. We've offered that three times to a combined audience, 2,200 plus uh, 300, plus 800, no, more than 300, whatever, about 3,500 people all together for those three courses. It's hard, to, it's hard to measure how many people are in a connectivist style course because the, the, the line at the edge of the course gets a little bit fuzzy, and that's deliberate. We want it that way. It doesn't matter whether you're in the course or not in the course. You know, it's, it's, it's really a very arbitrary distinction, and, and it can change from day to day, and that's okay. We used Grasshopper to offer these courses. The subject of the course was connectivism, and the idea was that it would be offered as an open online course. George Siemens and I offered the first of them in, in 2008. We figured we'd get 20 people. We got 2,200. And so our open online course became a massive open online course, hence the name MOOC. And we've set up a website, mooc.ca, uh, which is sort of in a stage of construction at the moment, to list other courses like this. It's an open online course. And we've offered a bunch of others. Uh, Plank, George has been naming these courses, and we have to stop him. <laughs> <laughs> That stands for Personal Learning Environments, Networks, and Knowledge. We offered that in 2010. Uh, Rita Kopp and Dave Cormier joined us for that one, and that, that had about 700 people in it. This is a connectivist course. And I use this diagram because this is the structure of the course. This is what George and I created. Uh, I haven't added what the students overlaid. But, but the important thing is, 
This is so not like what you see in a learning management system, isn't it? It's, it's completely different, and which is more amazing because we actually did in, in the first instance, the first two instances of the course actually, we also used Moodle as a discussion forum because we could. We had one available. Uh, so there is an instance of Moodle buried in there somewhere. Uh, it's up actually at the upper left. It's the bit that looks like the only structured bit in the entire diagram. Um, but we used Grasshopper, we used decentralized resources, we used Delicious, we used the wiki. Uh, what else did we have <laughs> looking because I forget. Uh, blogs, um, we had online sessions using Illuminate. We, we all declared our love for Illuminate. Um, there was the daily, which was a daily newsletter, similar to my regular daily newsletter, but it was a course newsletter, so it focused on the course. That's what we set up. Now, imagine 2,200 people, maybe 10% uh, of whom are, are active, the rest of whom are lurking, which is fine. We like lurkers. Lurkers are cool. Yeah. Most of the world is lurkers, so it's okay. Um, they overlaid this with, and I don't, I, normally when I present the connectivism talk, I have the next 10 slides or stuff that the students made. Uh, they created, well, in the, in the first version, there were three separate Second Life communities set up around the course, two in Spanish. Why two in Spanish? I don't know. There's Latin America, Spain. Uh, there, there were Google groups that were set up. There were LinkedIn groups that were set up, and Facebook. There's a, a very active Facebook now, CCK11, that came up out of the third one. What, what we found, we, and this is very interesting, we didn't expect this, people won't leave. The, the course finishes, the groups continue. Uh, in, in our 2009 course, which was the second course, half the people from the first course came back. Well, not half, but a large number of them came back. And it was very interesting for me as an instructor in this course because they, they came back and then they started teaching the course. And I'm sort of, no, wait. <laughs> and and if, 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 you, if you look, if you, we have all the recordings from all of the, uh, all of the sessions. And you, you look in like the second or third week of the 2008, sorry, 2009 version of Connectivism. There's me in there saying, this course is getting away from me. I don't even feel like I'm a part of it anymore. I don't know what's happening. Um, but that's exactly, on, ref on reflection, that's exactly what's supposed to happen. Our experience, this is uh, Rita Kopp and Helene Fournier, who would also make great people to come here and talk to you, <laughs> uh, did extensive research of CCK11. Uh, there's where the people came from all over the world. Uh, there's what they did. And as you can see, I mean, uh, so this is CCK11. The registrations ended up at about 1,600 by the end of the course. Um, blog posts started slow but continued to climb. Uh, Moodle discussions were almost non-existent in this version of the course. Uh, illuminate downloads kind of tailed off. Twitter, look at Twitter, that's the blue line. They took off and you know people, people used to criticize you know the early versions of the connectivism course because they'd look at the Moodle forum and they'd say everybody starts strong but then they really tail off. All right and yeah it's a Moodle forum. <laughs> They're gonna tail off. The, the people who have become alpha have taken over the forum and unless you really ride them they will drive everyone else away. If you really ride them, they will leave, but then everybody else will feel disempowered and they will, anyhow. So, so yeah, we had tail off. We had tail off in CCK 08. We had tail off in CCK 09. We totally downplayed the Moodle aspect in CCK 11, and we had great participation all the way to the end. Uh, our experience. Uh, a facilitator would post one thing in red, and an entire network of content would grow around it. But what was kind of neat was that would happen when students posted things too. Not, not as dense a network typically, but nonetheless, a network of resources 
could, didn't always do it, but it could grow up around a participant's contribution to the course. Our experience, especially with the tweets, is that the content in this kind of environment forms a network. The content of the course is basically a network. The content is not as important as the network, which turns out to be the thesis of connectivism. Here's the network around uh, Twitter Planck connections, because they also did some uh, work in the Planck course that we offered earlier in the year. Again, th this huge interconnected network of people, of topics, uh, uh, of resources. Now, I don't need to do this slide with you guys. You already know about the knowledge transfer thing, which is the old way of thinking of learning. The old way of thinking of learning where you feed in information, you run it through the mill, and out pops knowledge. It's kind of very mecha mechanistic, isn't it? So here's the old way of learning simplified. Data comes in, knowledge comes out. And, and I know that you guys don't do that anymore. Here's the old way with some tech layered on top of it. And you, know, you even have the little, the little activity meter. Sorry. I'm no good at animating, so. Um, but really, really, and here's, in my opinion, why you can't just do the transmission model. Really what's happening is there's the stuff that the data is doing, the stuff that the course content is doing, and then the stuff that the student is doing. And they're separate things, right? The course content never ends up in the student's brain. And there are really good reasons for that. And the best reason is you can't put course content in a brain. Uh, and, and I know that sounds like a really stupid thing to say, but if you stop and think about it, you can't put course content in a brain. Course content is a book. A brain is a whole bunch of neurons. And, and even, even the content, the, the content of a course is sentences and paragraphs and words. And, but if you look in a brain, you do not have sentences and paragraphs and words. And I know it feels like we do, but we don't. And what's happening is we are exposed to the effects of the course content, right? And, and this is even more the case in cases of uh, authentic learning, of practice-based learning, of network-based learning, where what we're after is not the transfer of content into a person's mind, but rather an exposure to and immersion in some sort of practice or enterprise. It's the, the income tax thing all over, right? It's you don't want to memorize the tax code. That would be ridiculous. But you want to become skilled at doing taxes. And that's kind of a, it's not a, a memory kind of thing. I don't even know what to describe it as because I know nothing about taxes, especially U.S. taxes. What is it? Right. All the time. Hopefully that microphone is picking me up. So this is just a metaphor. I'm not saying there are really inductive coils in people's minds, but because that would be as stupid as saying there are books in people's minds. But the idea here is that what's happening in this coil impacts what's happening in this coil. Our exposure to these things, our practice with uh, the, the technology or the skills or the environment, our immersion leads us to form new knowledge, which I would describe as new connections, leads us to grow new knowledge or new connections. And that's the thesis underneath connectivism. Connectivism is the thesis that knowledge is formed through the creation of these connections. That's all there is to it. Uh, it's actually too simple to be a theory and probably shouldn't be called a theory because a theory presupposes you know, some sort of ontological picture of the world and 
uh, and all the, you know, the causal connections between it and must, absolutely must, if it's a theory, postulate underlying hidden entities that we can't actually access, like mass or whatever. Um, and connectivism doesn't do that. Connectivism just simply says knowledge is formed through the creation of connections. I would go further. Knowledge is the creation of connections. To know something, on my mind, is to have a certain organization in the mind, a certain set of connections between neurons. Not a particular set. This is the trick, right? Because your knowledge that Paris is the capital of France is formed with a bunch of connections. Your knowledge that Paris is the capital of France is formed with a bunch of connections. If you compared the two sets of connections, totally different. Your brain is completely different from your brain. That's the bit, oh, it's a different diagram, but that's the bit where you're contributing, right? So your idea of Paris, your past experience of Paris, your having been or not been to Paris, all of these come into play. And so there isn't anything actually in common between your knowledge that Paris is the capital of France and your knowledge that, that Paris is the capital of France. The only thing in common is the fact that you have this set of connections such that <coughs> you do the appropriate things in the appropriate places, draw the appropriate associations, etc. I'm, I'm not going to say behaviorism because it's not behaviorism because there's an awful lot of cognitive content happening there. But knowledge that Paris is the capital of France is much more than simply checking the box Paris is the capital of France. There's a whole host of different behaviors behind it. It's kind of like getting it, just the way knowing that Saratoga is a horse town is getting it, right? The same, it's the same kind of thing. I, I just want to say that our courses are really designed for exactly that sort of thing. I mean, the interaction between the Oh, yeah. You know, from, from my students. And, and the way we facilitate the courses, yes, they've got reading, they've got texts to work from, they've got work that they need to demonstrate their knowledge. But these our discussions are such interactions, research and interactions between people's knowledge and experience and uh, connecting it to what they're learning in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the course. So, uh, I mean, I think our model is all about connecting. So it should be pointing at you, pointing you to something that is a post-learning management system then. When you're looking at what sort of technologi technological environment to adopt, you, you don't want a learning management system in my view. You want something that follows it, which is a personal learning environment. Unfortunately, there are no commercial personal learning environments available yet. That's coming. It will come. Guaranteed it's going to come. Uh, it's just a question of when. So I don't need to talk a lot about the methodology because you're probably employing the methodology in a much more detailed way than I can describe in the time that I have here, which is almost none now. Um, I know, I, I don't wear a watch, and so I have to judge time by intuition. And <laughs> OK. So. But the idea here is that it's a process of interaction, of working with material with an eye toward creating these connections, creating these uh, links between neurons in the mind, these links between ideas, resources, people, and entities in the world. And the model that I've used in the creation of, of Grasshopper and in the design of the connectivism courses I named after Alan Levine. Have you had Alan Levine here? <laughs> He's great. <laughs> and he, he used to work at Maricopa College and did all of their, all of their um, distance learning and online learning stuff. And then he took a job with the New Media Consortium and became a vice president. And he just left that job. Why? To travel around North America. Perfect. Uh, so he's available, too. <laughs> um, 
Anyhow, I named it, and, and you might be wondering, how does this come to be named after Alan Levine? His online persona is Cog Dog Blog, and he does, the dog motif, you have to know about dogs to get Alan, and so ARF, ag yeah. Aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. Bring together whatever. And I, I literally mean whatever. I mean, and our connectivist courses, the first thing we say to the students is, there is too much content. You cannot read it all. So your first act as a student in the course is to pick the content that's relevant, or at the very least interesting, or if nothing else, available to you. And so the very first learning act becomes the act of aggregation. Because they have to pick, out of all the stuff that we provide them, they have to pick what they're going to look at. And the, the intent here is to give everybody a different perspective on the material. We're not trying to teach everybody the same thing. We're trying to teach everybody different things. By teaching them different things, the conversations that they have together are much more interesting. If they all know the same thing, it's like everybody speaking the same word, right? A conversation with, where everybody says Paris is France nah, would go nowhere. Okay, that was a bad example. <laughs> but you get the idea, right? For conversations to be interesting and useful and educational, people have to have different points of view, different knowledge, different backgrounds. If they're all the same, the conversations get really boring and not helpful. It's an idea of learning as immersion. Uh, I was going to tell this nice story about listening on national public radio or some version thereof. On the way down here, they were covering student robot Olympics. And, uh, and so I listened to that for about two hours. It was great. And I, I'm not sure what channel it was. I don't think it was NPR, but it might have been. I, I can't tell. <laughs> Um, pardon? I don't know. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. But, uh, and what was interesting was it wasn't about how to build robots. Uh, that wasn't what, well, they did learn that, but that wasn't what they learned. It was all the stuff, all you know, the, the, the helping, the looking things up, figuring things out, solving problems on the fly, um, rebuilding when things don't work, all of that was the actual learning that happened. And you could really see that in the comments of the students who were involved in this. They, they'd, say, they'd say, well, what did you learn about learning robots? They couldn't actually remember. <laughs> but they learned all about what it was like to participate in an event like this. Uh, it's learning as immersion, which was the whole idea of the one laptop per child, the whole idea. And I wish it had been executed better. And in retrospect, probably people out of MIT weren't the people to implement this. But the idea was you put these tools into their hands, you give them the space, you give them the resources, and they will learn. And, and they will learn. There's uh, Sugrata, I can't pronounce his last name. Uh, you may have heard of him. He does, he's got a TED talk now, so he's newly famous all over again, uh, called The Hole in the Wall. And basically what he did is he put a computer in a wall, the glass front and the, the keyboard open in an impoverished area in India. And the kids gathered around his computer, taught themselves how to use it. And the same thing has been replicated many times now. It turns out, if you just put a computer in a hole in a wall, the kids in the neighborhood will learn how to use it. Go figure. It's constructionism, right? Uh, it's the idea of learning by creating, of learning by doing, uh, of learning through the artifacts that you, that you build, that you share, that you talk about, that you reflect on. Which brings us to language and brings us to lolcats. I'm going to go quickly through this because I don't have a lot of time, but I do want to tie these things together. I'd so love to tie these things together. This is a lolcat. Uh, a lolcat doesn't necessarily have to have a cat. But what a lolcat is, is typically an image that has been altered in a humorous way. This is an image that has been altered in a humorous way. It began as a picture of someone now known worldwide as tourist guy. And it's, it's 
the whole getting it thing, knowing that he has a name, he will have a name, he'll always have a name. Anyhow, tourist guy on top of the World Trade Center, of course, and you see the airplane in the background. Not in the best of taste, I agree. <laughs> Law cats are almost never in the best of taste, right? Okay, so here's tourist guy in front of the Hindenburg disaster. Here's tourist guy in front of another disaster. This is Kanye West interrupting, um, oh darn, uh, Taylor Swift at the Grammys. Which of these was the greatest disaster of them all? The, the point of lol chats and the point of, of language in general is that language is almost never words, paragraphs, and sentences. Yeah, language is words, paragraphs, and sentences. There is a subsection of language that is words, paragraphs, and sentences. But this is a language. Lol chats is a language. Again, I have a whole talk devoted to that, right? Proving that lol chats is a language. There's a shared understanding, which is not necessarily shared, which variable changes over time. There, there are ways of getting it, and then there are ways of not getting it. And if you ever go to the website, ICANHASCHEESEBURGER.COM, uh, I'm sorry, um, you, you, you can see an endless list of lol chats. Like, say, Cheeseburger became a network, Cheeseburg, Cheeseburger Network, and they just sold for, I don't know, several million dollars. So, so I mean, it's a real thing. But the thing is, there's a whole community, there's a whole culture that builds up around these things. The internet is full of them. Absolutely chock full of them. Log chats are just one thing. Some people characterize them as memes, but memes is wrong. I mean, these are all entire separate languages, and they are like the language of dressing and clothes. The royal wedding, you should have seen the language happening there. <laughs> right? The, the body language, clothing, uniform, flags, drapes, all of these are languages. Maps, diagrams, graphics, this is from a site called xkcd.com. <coughs> Fabulous. If, if you're a geek, you must be reading xkcd.com daily. This is a map using the conventions of the language of maps in order to represent the influence of different social networking services. I like the, the icy north, Yahoo, Windows Live. <laughs> the blog epagula. Think of, again, language is conventions, right? Language is ways of doing things. So we have the blog epagula, right? Well, it's the classic way we form words. And everybody in the room knows what we mean by blog epigolo. As soon as we say it, despite the fact that it has never been defined, never been learned. Language is a way of living, as Wittgenstein would say. Cave paintings are languages. I have a whole talk on this picture. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's a cave painting. It's a picture I took of a cave painting in Kakadu, Australia, and it's fish guts. And it's how they taught themselves about fish, which was really important to aboriginals living 10,000 years ago in Australia. Old media, new media, the, the leave Brittany alone meme. Again, it's just like log cats. There, there's like, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of resources devoted to this online. I can, I can tell who gets it and who doesn't just by looking at your reactions. <laughs> Right? And those of you who don't get it, that's okay. You're still getting the point, I hope, that these things are like a language, have association, are different ways of, I don't want to say representing, that's the wrong word, but I'll use it anyways for lack of a better word that I can find in the one second I have to find it. Representations of the world. Sorry about that. Old media, new media. Old media conceptions like messages have a sender and receiver, no longer apply. People put messages out whether or not there are receivers. I have a radio station. The average listenership of my radio station, zero. I'm serious. I've been running it, I've been running it for a while now. 
Right now, there might be a few people on it, but I mean, but it, it, it went all day yesterday, nobody on it. Day before, nobody on it. An old media conception, words get meaning from what they represent. Not anymore. Words are just words. Words are pictures. Pictures are words. Ichan has cheeseburger. Do you know where that started from? A picture of a cat with the slogan, I can has cheeseburger, question mark. What does that represent? No one knows. <laughs> it probably doesn't represent anything. The idea that truth is based on the real world. Now, there is a sense of truth in which truth is based on the real world, and that is, that is a useful sense of truth. Otherwise, we would die. But it's not the only sense of truth. Is not even necessarily the true sense of truth. And I have a background in philosophy, so don't. <laughs> the idea that events have a cause and causes can be known. You want to you confuse educational reformers, and I know you have them here. <laughs> Go ask them for their theory of causation. Because they think you can cause certain things by doing simple little things. They think, there's, there's a, a, a set of papers by people like Kirchner, Sweller, and Clark on educational content and uh, cognitive load and all of that other stuff. And they think, and, and what's his name, um, uh, Ludger, I'm, I'm getting his first name wrong, Ludger Vussmann who does the reanalysis of these uh, PISA evaluations. The PISA evaluations are international evaluations of ed educational outcomes of 15-year-olds. And Vussman comes along after the fact and reevaluates them, holding some variables constant and then evaluating for other variables. It's the same sort of mechanism they use in the Campbell collaboration and the Cochrane collaboration uh, for uh, assessing medical outcomes. And the principle there is you can hold variables constant and measure for the impact of a single variable. Sounds like good methodological principle, but it's f pure fantasy. It's pure fantasy, totally made up. You, you can, well, you, no, you can, but you have to pretend to do it. <laughs> so, uh, here, here's an example of this sort of logic in action. Okay, let's. We want to know the impact of lowering the interest rates. So let's lower the interest rates here, but keep them up in the next town over. Well, everybody in the next town would come here. <laughs> you can't keep the two separate. And yet there's the, this method of assessing for educational outcomes is based on a picture of the world that is made up of atoms and interacting particles, and even there, not even, it's a, a picture of the world like a clockwork, a picture of the world like a system. But really the world is complex. Really the world is composed of multiple mutually dependent variables, mutually interactive variables. You change one, you change the whole set. You can't just hold one constant. You get fake results if you do that. And that boils down to saying causes can be known. You can't know causes. You can know trends. You, you, can, you, know, you can predict the weather. But knowing the cause of this and the cause of that really is kind of a mugs game. Open educational resources are a language, not content. Now, you guys already know that they're not content. But the second part of the picture is they are the words of a language. If we're good, and by we I mean all of us, everybody involved in the creation of these things, including our students, if we're good, they are the words that students actually use when they're talking to each other. Uh, if we're not good, they'll ignore our, our language and make up their own. And we know they will make up their own because they've been doing it nonstop since the start of the Internet. And they were doing it before. It's just they did it secretly. Then now you can see it. The open educational resources are the words, the vocabulary, 
the sentences that people use in order to express themselves, in order to learn new things. That, in a nutshell, is why they need to be open. We can understand this new language. I'll go very quickly through this. I've identified six major areas or major ways we can understand this new language, ways of interpreting this new language. It's just what I've come up with. It's not authoritative. Nothing I say is authoritative because nothing is authoritative. Never mind. <laughs> but it's a useful frame, as George Lakoff would say. Syntax, forms, archetypes, rules, operations, patterns, similarities. You think of lol cats and, and, and the way people manipulated that World Trade Center picture with the airplane and tourist guy. You can look at the forms, the archetypes, the patterns in that. Semantics, not just theories of truth, but also theories of meaning, purposes, goals, how we interpret things, how we associate things with each other, and on what basis we associate things, how we make decisions, how we as a society come to believe things. And it's interesting, ask what society believes, and then ask, did they vote on that? Well, no, most things society believes, nobody voted but society has beliefs. How did that happen? There's a whole semantic story to be told here. Pragmatics, how we use language to do things, to make assertions, to direct people, to express things, to ask things, to make meaning, as, as Wittgenstein would say. Except Wittgenstein would never say make meaning. He might say grow meaning or show meaning, but anyhow. Cognition. Inference, discovery, creativity. In yet another talk, I identify four major elements of cognition. I'm pretty sure this is authoritative. Just kidding. Um, description, definition, argument, and explanation. But they're all ways of going from what we have to something new. The building, inferring, knowing. Context, placement, environment. Uh, range of possibilities, logical space, worldviews. Again, we can take any of these languages, think tourist guy again, and put them into a frame. It's interesting. Me putting that slide up here in Saratoga Springs gets a very different reaction, palpably different re reaction than if I show it in Canada or in Europe. And nobody said anything but there was language, believe me. What's the difference? You guys, you guys all reacted. All of you, and, and, and not pleasantly. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a collective intake of breath, a tensing. It was, it was there. Right? I, I could read it like I could read a book. Uh, and because this is talk number 273, I could read it like I could read a book. You guys can probably do it too. Uh, all of you who teach classes can, can read that class. If you've taught you know, 273 classes, you can do that. That's, that's what I mean. Um, maybe I shouldn't have used it. But, but the reaction almost, almost made it worth it because now it's a really good example. Uh, sixth sixth uh, frame for interpreting language, change. Language is all about flow, is all about connection, is all about progression, is all about directionality, historicity. Language happens through duration. There's no such thing as an instantaneous expression of language. I was looking for, I was going to say instantaneous instant of language, but that didn't make sense. And then, anyhow. We hear people talking about 21st century skills. I would much rather say 21st century languages. The idea that these things are skills is ridiculous, frankly. Um, understanding them as new languages that have come into being as a direct consequence of new technologies and new ways of looking at the world is a much better way of understanding what people are trying to get at when they talk about 21st century skills. Because when, when you talk about 21st century skills, there's always somebody in the back of the audience um, going, well, those are just like the skills that we had when I was a kid. 
except you know for tweeting and not putting your address in Facebook. I'll tell you one better. In, Sure. Yeah. So, and and the point is, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm agreeing with you, but I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. All right. See now the intra and, and think about and I'm almost at the end here, and I know you're all getting a little edgy because I'm standing between you and lunch. <laughs> Um, and you don't want me standing between you and lunch. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what was I going to say? Like even that, Remar, if you if you if you're watching me and 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 trying to figure out what's going on in my head, what's going on in my head is he makes that remark. You can see me run through syntax, semantics, pragmatic. What's he trying to say? What does he mean? What's he trying? All of those things. Right? I'm trying to do it on a dime, and because I need a quarter, I don't have the time to correctly interpret it. So what do I do? Season speaker. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a frame for the analysis of the skills, quote unquote, performance simulation, appropriation, blah blah blah. Uh, I, I can put accounting there. Now I've made sense of your comment. I can make accounting another column. What is the syntax of accounting? What is the semantics of accounting? There are meanings to these columns of numbers that are more important than the rules of the tax code. Oh, I wish I could go on about that. There's one block of that frame filled out, performance with respect to syntax. And you can see really quickly how detailed we can get in this sort of analysis. Nobody wants to get that. And the, the funny thing is, getting that detailed won't really help you. It'll give you the facts, but what you need that feel for it. And that's the harder thing. That's why you need the practice and the reflection rather than the memory. Knowing these things, knowing Stanislavski's system doesn't, get, doesn't give you a feel for the concept of forms of performance. Assessment and analytics, personal knowledge, learning outcomes, learning outcomes, blah, 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 is, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the key point here, we recognize when we have formed one of these networks in our mind, not by performance on a test, etc., as you know, but rather by performance in an overall network. The network that forms in the mind that becomes knowledge and the network in which we employ, express, acquire, whatever, that knowledge, these two things interact. And we can know one by the other. How do you guys know what I think Paris is? I haven't told you what I think Paris is, but you've got a clue now because you've seen me in an interactive mode talking a little bit about Paris. And now you can all create your own theory. Well, I know he knows it's the capital of France, but you, you've probably inferred other things that I might know about Paris as well. It's a word. It should be capitalized. <laughs> so assessment is real, and, and other people, not me, have done entire talks about this. Assessment is gathering the analytics of how somebody performs in this network. And these analytics tell a story. These analytics, uh, analytics give you a picture. And a person, a person who is already an expert in this discipline doesn't need the analytics. They know that somebody has become a physicist or, or an accountant, not by tallying specific facts or competencies or whatever, but by recognizing that the person is indeed an accountant. And there, there's a whole idea here of knowledge as recognition rather than knowledge as the accumulation of data and facts, which I think underlies that theory. So what makes one of these networks work? What makes one of these courses work is the concept of network democracy. Four slides and we're out of here. 
five. <laughs> <laughs> Networks work and are known to work and can be proven mathematically to work better when they embrace diversity. It's that comment I made earlier, different people saying different things results in interesting conversations. Networks work and can be known to work, et cetera, et cetera, when they are open. Closed networks, locked down networks are not able to form new connections. They become stagnant. They embrace a condition I call, and I imagine other people would call, network death. The entities in the network function best, function properly, if they are autonomous making their own decisions, doing their own things, following their own objectives, working toward their own goals. There are administrators in the room, so I will say this. The idea that everybody in an organization works under the same vision is hokum. Everybody working for an organization has their own reason for working there. Of course they do. Me. I work at NRC in order to feed my cats. Because <laughs> I have four cats. I need a full time job. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but if you went and asked each person, why do you work here? You, you ask 20 people, you'll get 20 answers. That's good, not bad. And the reason why it's good is this last condition, networks work as a consequence of interactivity. Truth, value, creativity is created in a network through interactivity. There's, there's two ways of looking at these things, right? One way is the idea comes from the top and then is propagated so that the person at the top has the idea and then everybody has a little copy of that idea, which is how we normally do things which means that the best that your organization can do is whatever that one guy had in his mind. But in an interactive organization where knowledge, values, etc., are created by the interactivity, knowledge, values, etc., emerge from the organization. And when I say emerge, I'm using that as a technical term. If you look it up on Wikipedia, you can look it up under emergence. And the idea here is that the knowledge is not contained by any individual person, but becomes into existence only as a result of that interactivity. Fly a 747 from Paris to New York. Now you know another thing I know about Paris. Uh, <laughs> and you'll see what I mean. No one person knows everything you need to know to fly that airplane. Couldn't possibly, there's too much to know. The only way you can pull off something like that is to get a bunch of people with different knowledge, different skills, and have them interact, right? Uh, have some people do tires, other people do windshields, other people learn how to take off, other people learn how to land, preferably successfully, etc. You even need people to serve coffee because you know, passengers will rebel. So. That's the fourth characteristic of a successful network. These are controversial principles. These are principles that are not practiced in most organizations. Autonomy, diversity, openness, interactivity. I said earlier, I don't know who's in the course, who's not, doesn't matter. That's openness, right? Transparent boundaries, permeable boundaries. It shouldn't matter. <laughs>